So, you know, the numbers now coming in from the election results and they're doing the recounts in Florida and Arizona. I can't believe they voted for that woman in cinema, but do not think, I, you know, I'm hearing a lot of things that the election was stolen in Arizona. It wasn't. Uh, I hear from John Gabriel, who is an Arizonan, that uh, Mick Sally's campaign, obviously she was a much more appealing candidate to us, but she ran a kind of prevent defense campaign. It was not a good, not an aggressive campaign. Cinema sold herself hard as a moderate. So she's ahead. But the thing I wanted to get to, you know, when the election first happened, I talked about what a victory it was for Donald Trump culturally, the thing that I really care about, because I think the culture affects what you're going to be seeing 20 years down the line. And Donald Trump has changed the culture in a lot of ways. He has made it permissible to speak up when the NFL is not saluting the flag, permissible to say, hey, I'm going to say Merry Christmas, permissible to say to the news media, you know what? You stink. You lie constantly in favor of Democrats. We hate you. You do a bad job. And he has shown that you can do that and walk away without a scratch. On the other hand, on the other hand, I think it's important to point out that he, he did not walk away without a scratch for the thing that I complain about all the time, which is his bad manners. You know, he was so successful as president, the economy, the war against ISIS, which he won essentially, his, uh, you know, regulation, dialing back regulations, his judge picks, he's been so successful that the only reason people have turned against him really is because of his manner, because of the way he does things and everything he could, he does could be done with a little bit more grace, but that's not the way he is. Okay, that's fine. But Henry Olson, who is one of my favorite observers of the political scene, he saw something else in these elections as the numbers come in. And one of the things I like about Olson is he doesn't say, he doesn't announce his uh, the conclusions on the day of the election, because he takes some time and he thinks about it. And he's talking about the fact that our country is continuing to divide. And it is a di division of places. It's a division between the cities and the suburbs and the countries now and, and the country and the towns. This is not necessarily a question of uh, race. It's not necessarily a question of education, though education plays into it. More educated people tend to congregate in cities. But it is a question of a way of life. And he says, there are two nations now. The first nation, the U.S.'s large cities and suburbs, was Democratic before last week and became much more Democratic on Tuesday. The second nation, the U.S.'s smaller cities and towns and countryside, was Republican before last week and remained Republican on Tuesday. And what he says about this is this is good news for Trump 2020 because it means he has a clear path to winning the Electoral College again, even if, again, he loses the popular vote. And, you know, we we decide our elections with the Electoral College, but it's not necessarily a good thing to continually win the Electoral College and not be able to deliver the popular vote. I mean, even the founders talk about this in the Federalist Papers, that you want ultimately a sense that the majority is ruling the country. And so it would be good if we could get a little unity uh, going together, coming together, you know, it, and I, I feel this, you know, I feel this kind of moving. It wasn't just that Crenshaw thing on Saturday Night Live, the Dan Crenshaw reconciliation video. It's a whole feeling that, that, that the outrage that I noticed I was talking about yesterday when you go on and everybody's outraged about every little thing is that addiction, you know, that Glenn Beck talks about, that addiction to outrage, that in the wake of this election, that we, nobody won. You know, there was a little bit for everybody. There were losses for uh, the, for both the Democrats and for the Republicans. And not only that, there was a sense that this battle, this pitched battle that we're in with each other is not going to be resolved. It's not like the left is going to disappear and it's not like the right is going to disappear. It is going to be this continual struggle. And if we keep the radicals out of it, I mean, obviously the alt-right, we I reject completely. And if you keep the radicals, when I talk about the radicals on the left, I'm talking about the people in power and, and the news media. I think that is really the problem. But when you keep them out of it, liberals and conservatives are in this kind of dance that we can go f use to move forward. They they talk about we talk about the need to preserve our institutions and traditions. They talk about the fact who those institutions and traditions are not serving and how we can uh, and how we can serve them. The problem is the difference between what the cities want and what the country want. The thing is. The difference between the cities and the countries is the same difference we have in, when we talk about the Supreme Court. When we talk about the Supreme Court, I always say it's not a fair it's not a fair debate because it's not like the right is saying we want judges to give us right wing decisions and the left is saying we want judges to give us left wing decisions. The left is saying we want judges to give us left wing decisions and the right is saying we want judges to give us constitutional decisions. And the same thing is true of town and city, OK, or country and city, let's call it. Cities tend to be a more liberal 
and they're creative places. They've got a little bit more chaos. The thing is, when you live in a city, and I've lived in cities for a lot of my life, even though I don't like cities, I prefer living in the country. I've lived in cities for work most of my life. And when you live in cities, everything is taken care of for you. Every, and so you live your life. And, you know, the garbage disappears. You put it in a chute in your apartment. It's gone. You know, you don't have to think about when the trucks are coming or take the garbage down or anything like this. Everything is kind of regulated. And you think that that's a good way to live. And you can go and do your work. It's all dedicated to work and sort of the arts and all that. And that's the way they think of freedom. Whereas in the country, you do your own life. You know, you mow your lawn, you rake your lawn, you fix your house, you do, you do stuff. And you have your neighbors and you have this, a lot of social capital. You have churches, you have associations, things that exist in cities but don't dominate the landscape in the same way. So what country life and small town life and small city life contribute to the country is this kind of social capital that turns into moral capital that is the way that we hold up the roof of a civilized society. Cities don't have that. If all the world were run like cities, all the world would be as chaotic and as uh, you know um, violent and as dangerous as cities are, it might be as creative, but I don't think so. I think it would just lead to chaos. The problem is it's not a fair debate. The people in the country want to be left alone. They don't want to tell people in the city how to live. Nobody out in the country is thinking, you know, I just want somebody to tell those people in New York to stop chasing each other around the desks and live like I live. They're not thinking that. That's not what they're thinking. They're thinking, I want to be left alone. That is the conservative idea of freedom. Leave me alone. The cities want to tell everybody what to do. The cities want to tell everybody what to do. I mean, this, this I remember in, in England, it was about fox hunting. They would sit in the city and say, this is cruel fox hunting. You don't know what fox hunting is. You're living in London. Shut up and let the people in the country have their traditions and do their thing. If people in the cities would not did not want to dominate countries, did not want to yell at them constantly from their perches where they run the media, where they run Hollywood, where they run the academies, they, they wouldn't have the same problem. The problem is they are not listening. They do not listen to what the country wants. And we know this from the ceaseless attacks on Donald Trump. One of the problems with Trump and one of the things I keep complaining about is a lot of times he says true stuff in such a way that nobody will listen to him. Like when he was talking about the California fires we're having here, he said a lot of this is to do with forest management and the firemen were out there with the hoses and the people were running from their houses and driving through flames. And it was like, uh, you have to bring that up right now? I mean, it is true. Forest management is messed up in California and on the federal lands in California because an environmental movement has made it too hard to clear out the debris, to clear out, to clear the forest of all the debris that just turns into tinder. And so their fires go up, you know, like a matchbox. And, and he's absolutely right about it. But just a little bit of timing there, Donald, and you could actually have gotten that message across. We're not listening to one another, and it doesn't help when everything is outrage, when everything is about screaming, when everything is about beating the other guy. And that's why that Saturday Night Live moment was so impressive to me.